This morning we're only going to bite off a, a piece of John chapter 3 because it is, um, has quite a number of things. And actually, as you spend just a little bit of time trying to explain different features in here, you find that the sermon just continues to grow and grow, and after a while it's bigger than you can really deliver at one, one time. So we are just going to take it a piece at a time, and what we're going to look at this morning are simply the first eight verses of John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Um, this doesn't uh, finish Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus, but it does at least uh, conclude one the one area we want to look at this morning, and that is what is Jesus talking about when he says you must be born again, you must be born a second time. What is he referring to? Well, I think we all know pretty much what that is, but we do need to be reminded because we need it. And those who are in darkness need it. Otherwise, we can't be saved. So let's read John 3, verses 1 through 8. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. May the Lord bless his word again to our understanding this morning. Now, last time we, we saw Jesus at Jerusalem, remember, at the Feast of Passover. Remember that every Jewish man had to appear before God three times a year at, at three particular feasts, Passover, Pentecost and Tabernacles. And so Jesus was there to honor his father. What his father's wishes were, Jesus was pleased to do. But we also saw that his desire to honor his father went even further than just merely attending uh, the, the, the feast. When he came to the temple and he found uh, all that merchandising that was going on in the outer court, remember all the sacrificial animals that were for sale? the money changers who were there waiting to exchange currency. Jesus made a scourge. He went in there and he basically cleaned it out. He overturned all the tables and he drove them out with his whip. He didn't want these hucksters, again, they were there mainly just to make money. He didn't want them to stand in the way of anyone sincerely coming to his father to worship or more importantly, of course, to find him. Salvation is something that is offered freely to whomever will receive it. It's a free gift of God. And we see that particularly now in the New Covenant. That's why Jesus came. He came to purchase salvation. He came to buy it and to give it freely to whomever would receive it, to whomever would come to him. But we also saw that Jesus did even more than this. He also performed many signs. And we read that there were many who saw him and many who believed in him. And we actually discover this morning there were even some Pharisees who believed on him. Now, in our text this morning, we do see one of the most respected leaders of Israel come to Jesus by night to ask him some questions. Nicodemus says that he had seen, as well as others, what Jesus had done. He knew that God had sent him, that God was with him, because no one could do the things that he did unless God was working with him. And so Nicodemus comes to Jesus very understandably to learn more from him about God's kingdom, specifically how one enters that kingdom. And that's what Jesus now tells him. And of course, if you're at all interested in how it is you can enter into the kingdom of heaven yourself, you will want to pay attention to what Jesus says to Nicodemus. Now this morning, I want us to consider three things. 
First of all, if you want to know more about God's kingdom, you do need to come to Jesus. Secondly, if you want to enter into that kingdom, you must be born a second time. And then thirdly, if you are to be born a second time, the Spirit is the one who must bring it about. So first of all, if you want to know more about God's kingdom, you need to come to Jesus. That is what we see Nicodemus doing. We read in verses 1 and 2. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do the things or these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, first of all, I think we should ask the question, who was Nicodemus? Well, John tells us that he was a, a Pharisee. Okay, Pharisee, that's kind of a loaded thing, isn't it? Because we all know what Pharisees are like. Well, at this time, you know, Pharisees were actually one of three religious schools that had formed after that intertestamental period. You know, Pharisees didn't exist at the end of the Old Covenant. But we do see them when we, we come into the, the opening of the New Covenant. We see they already exist. Well, they, they actually began to exist um, within that intertestamental uh, period, we call it, at 400 years, around 145 B.C. There were actually three schools that sprung up. The Pharisees were one, the Essenes were another, and the Sadducees were the other. Now, the, the Essenes, I think it pretty much disappeared from view by the time the New Testament opens, but when they existed, they were the ascetics of their day. You might say they were the pre-monastics. You know, we talk about monasticism. We talk about retreating from the world, or at least how the church did that, went into the cloisters, separated themselves from the world, and sought, sought God. Well, these Essenes were like the ascetics of their day. They believed in poverty. You know, they didn't, they didn't want the wealth of the world because they knew it could corrupt. They believed in shared property. Nothing that I have really belongs to me, but it belongs to the whole body. They practiced daily immersion in water, which, who knows, may be a, like a prefiguring of, of baptism. They believed in works of charity. Some groups uh, practiced celibacy. And interestingly enough, they believed in the absolute sovereignty of God. They were sort of pre-Calvinistic in a way. Uh, they established communities all throughout Judea and were believed by many to be the authors of, of what are the Dead Sea Scrolls. Perhaps you've heard of those. And they found those in caves around the, uh, the Jordan River and so forth, around the Dead Sea. Um, they thought that perhaps these were the ones who actually preserved those writings and, and hid them in those caves. Now the Sadducees, on the other hand, were almost the exact opposite of these scenes. They were the liberals of their day. They didn't believe in God's sovereignty. They didn't believe that there was life after death. They didn't believe in rewards and punishments. They didn't believe in spirits. They didn't believe in angels. They believed man was free to choose what he wanted, either good or evil, that he wasn't necessarily predisposed in either direction. Basically, they represent what we would call the liberals in the church today. You know, they had their liberals in, that, in their day, and we had our liberals today. Well, the Pharisees were sort of in between. They agreed that man has a free will, they agreed that God did not predetermine the future, and they were wrong there. But he did know exactly what was going to happen. They did believe in angels, they believed in spirits, they believed there was going to be a resurrection, and that the righteous would be rewarded and the wicked punished. Well, they were right there too. But they also believed that obedience to the law was essential for salvation. You know very well, they looked to obedience, they looked to the law for their entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Now, the interesting thing is they were very exacting in their obedience for that reason, and yet, very understandably, because they were not converted, they didn't have the spirit, they were very lax in their interpretation of the law, which is why Jesus, we find him often rebuking them. Well, most of the Pharisees we run into in the Gospels are nothing more than religious hypocrites. They're basically trying to earn their way to salvation and, con con and convincing themselves that they've actually made it. And, of course, putting a great deal of emphasis on the fact that they are the children of Abraham as to why they are going to enter into heaven. But John tells us there were a few who actually believed Jesus and followed him. And Nicodemus was one of them. Nicodemus was, a, was a, also a ruler of the Jews. He tells us he was a leader in the church. He was not a leader in Roman government. 
but he was a very prominent Pharisee. You know, here's another interesting tidbit. History also seems to point out the possibility that this Nicodemus was the brother of Josephus. And if you know anything about um, the, you know, the wars of the Jews and the writings uh, that we rely on to tell us what happened in 70 AD, Josephus is the historian, the Jewish historian, who recorded the, that fall. Josephus' full name is Josephus Ben-Gorion. And that particular Josephus had a very famous brother at that time whose name was Nicodemus Ben-Gorion who very closely fits John's description of this Nicodemus who also lived during the same time. So it's quite possible that this is the brother of Josephus. So that's kind of an interesting connection. Now this Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night apparently to find the answer to some important questions. And we might ask, well, why at night? Well, there's a few explanations that have been given. Uh, after all, he was, as Jesus is going to call him in another place, the teacher of Israel. Why is the teacher of Israel coming to an itinerant preacher to learn about the kingdom of heaven? Well, that could be somewhat embarrassing. Maybe Nicodemus came to Jesus at night because he didn't want to be seen asking Jesus these questions. Or maybe he was afraid of what the Pharisees would think or what the Sadducees might think. Or maybe it was just easier to get to Jesus because he was so popular. You know, maybe the evening was the only time he could really have this kind of audience with him. We don't really know why he came at night. But we do know a couple of things. We do know what Nicodemus thought about Jesus. He considered Jesus to be a rabbi. And rabbi is a term of honor. It refers to somebody who is recognized as an outstanding teacher of the law. Now here is this teacher of Israel who calls Jesus rabbi. That tells us something about what Nicodemus thought about Jesus. He also believed that God had sent him. We know that you have come from God, Jesus said. And the miracles that Jesus had done proved that. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And by the way, I want you to... Uh, to note that Nicodemus was not alone in these particular views because he says, we know that you have come from God. Now, that wasn't the majority opinion of his, of his fellow Pharisees by any means, but there were some people along with Nicodemus who were of the Pharisees who actually believed that Jesus had come from God. One other notable one would be Joseph of Arimathea. Now, the most important thing to see here is why Nicodemus came to Jesus. Now, we're really not told. I mean, Nicodemus doesn't express any, you know, um, overt or explicit question. But from what Jesus says to him, it's clear that he wanted to know how to enter God's kingdom. And what better way to answer this question than to come to somebody who obviously has been sent from God. Now, again, here's our first point. How do you learn the truth about salvation? Where do you go? Do you just simply count heads? See who believes what? Do you go to your friends and, and just kind of go with the majority opinion among your friends? Well, a lot of people do that. But you need to remember that people can be wrong. Opinions can be wrong. Your friends can be wrong. Well, should you go with your gut feeling? I mean, what seems right to you? Uh, no, obviously not, because you can deceive yourself. The Bible reminds us, God warns us, that the heart is deceitful above all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? If you want to learn the truth about the kingdom of God, if you really want to know about how to enter it, there's really only one place you can go. You have to go to Jesus. And how do you go to Jesus? I mean, he's in heaven. Well, thankfully, Jesus has left us a book a book that he has written. Remember the spirit who inspired the Bible is the spirit of Christ. And he is the one who gave this information so that we might actually know him and in knowing him enter into the kingdom of heaven. You need to read the Bible. You need to go to Jesus. You need to see what he has to say. And you need to pray at the same time that the spirit of God would do his work. We've already seen that you can't really see things as you should unless the Spirit of God works in your heart. You need to pray that the Spirit of God would open your eyes. That work of illumination that we prayed, I think it was in the second hymn, 
uh, that he would give you that illumination and open your eyes to see what it is, not only what it is that God says or what Jesus says, but that you would see the beauty of this and desire it in your own life and that he would give you, as it were, that heart to receive, to believe it, to receive it, and to act upon it. Whenever you have any question that relates to the kingdom of God, how to enter it, what it is that God wants you to do with your life, how you, you know, should serve Him, what's right, what's wrong, you have to go to the Word. If you're not walking in the Word, you're on dangerous ground. But now let's get to the second point. What did Jesus say as far as how to enter into the kingdom of heaven? He says if you are to enter His kingdom, you need to be born a second time. John writes in verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, we've already seen Nicodemus recognize Jesus as a great teacher, one who was sent from God. John Gill, from this, and, and perhaps rightly so, concludes that Nicodemus was likely already fully convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, you need to understand the Jews believed that Messiah would be a teacher. I mean, what good would the Messiah be if he couldn't teach you what it is that God wants? They believed Messiah would be an expert in the law of God. And most importantly, they believed that he would have the final word on how to enter into God's kingdom. So what does Jesus say to Nicodemus with regard to this? Well, the first thing he tells him is this. Nicodemus, it's not enough to believe that I'm a great teacher, a rabbi. It's not enough, Nicodemus, to believe that I have been sent from God. And I think we could even infer it's not enough to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. You do need to believe these things in order to be saved, but by themselves, this is really not enough because the Bible warns us that even the demons believe the truth. They know very well who God is. They know very well what God expects. They even shudder when they think about it. They're afraid. James writes in James 2.19, you believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. But you see, that's not enough to save them. And that's not enough to save you. You need something more than just right belief. Jesus also implies here to Nicodemus that it isn't enough to be a Jew. And I think that's behind what he's saying, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now the Jews believed, and I think you know this, that when the Messiah came finally to set up his kingdom, that they would have their share in that kingdom because they are Abraham's descendants. You know, that's their whole hope. The law of God and the fact that they're Abraham's children. These two things make for entrance into the kingdom of heaven. But no, that, that's not enough either. By the way, we can pause here for a moment and wonder or, or ask the question, is that your hope? You know, maybe you were born into a Christian family and maybe you thought that was enough. Or maybe you thought being raised in a Christian church with the truth of God, that was enough. Or maybe being baptized in the church was enough. Or making profession of faith in the church somehow entitled you to enter into God's kingdom, but you realize that isn't enough. You can't be born into this kingdom, at least naturally. Circumcision, baptism, education, even profession of faith will not open the door. Jesus says, you must be born again. It's not enough to have right belief or even to be a member of a church. You have to have this new birth. Now Nicodemus thought that Jesus was speaking literally and he begins wondering, well, how can, how can this be? How can a man, he says in verse 3, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? No, obviously not. That would be impossible. Just like entering into the kingdom in these other ways is impossible. Right belief, right heritage, right parentage as it were. But that's obviously not, not what Jesus meant. He was saying you need a new birth, but a different kind of birth, a spiritual rebirth. Verses 5 and 6, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Jesus says you must be born twice. You must be born again. First of the water and then of the Spirit. Now what does Jesus mean? Well, first of all, what does he mean by being born of water? Some see this water birth most, you know, uh, I think understandably, as baptism. And they teach that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. But clearly, Scripture tells us baptism can't save you. It is commanded to those who already believe, you know, and of course if you believe, you've already entered into the kingdom of heaven, but it's not what causes you to enter into that kingdom. And I want you to notice too that if that is what Jesus was speaking about here, uh, water baptism, he's also saying the same thing. It's not enough. Being born of the water is not enough. You must also be born of the Spirit. So this is not teaching water baptism. You need spirit baptism. Well, others see this water birth as a picture of God's grace because sometimes in the Bible, uh, grace is pictured as water that God sprinkles on us. You know, I'll sprinkle water on you and you will be clean. Basically, that's what baptismal water represents as well, the grace of God that washes away our sins. It doesn't wash away our sins, but it represents that which does. But you see, that would be the same thing as spiritual birth, wouldn't it? So what Jesus would be saying is you must be born of God's grace even by the Spirit, or in other words, by the Spirit. And, and that's certainly a possibility. But it's also possible that Jesus is simply referring to the natural birth. And I think having in mind a little bit more clearly here one's parental heritage. I mean, what does it mean to be born of the water? Well could mean, as I said, natural birth. For the first nine months of your life, you're essentially immersed in water. We don't like to think about that, but that's the way it is, right? And when you're born, the first thing that comes out is water, the water that you were in for the last nine months. And that may explain why, why Jesus says in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. In other words, he might be paral uh, paralleling these two things, which was very common in, in Hebrew, or at least the Hebrew culture, you say one thing and then you explain it by the next thing you say. You need to be born of the water and of the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So you see the parallelism that exists there. So perhaps Jesus is referring to natural birth. Well, why isn't natural birth enough to enter into God's kingdom? Well, it's because that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And flesh, remember in Scripture, is another name for your sin nature. And if that's all that you have, you cannot please God. And so you cannot enter into His kingdom. Remember what we just read in Romans chapter 8, what Paul writes in Romans 8 verses 5 through 9. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You know, Jesus says in John, in John 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life, the flesh Profits nothing. If that's all you have is flesh, basically what, it's, what Paul is saying here is you hate God. You will not do what God tells you to do. You refuse to repent of your sins. You're just going to do what you want to do. And as long as you're in that kind of state, there's no way that what, you, what you're doing or what you're going to do is going to please God. You cannot please God. You are not able to do so. You need something more than natural birth. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. You need a spiritual rebirth. The Spirit must raise you again to life. You're spiritually dead. He must quicken you. He needs to work faith and repentance in you. Or you will not see the kingdom of heaven because you can only see it through the eyes of faith. There's no place in this world you can go to look at it. You can only see it through the eyes of faith. Unless you have the spiritual rebirth, you cannot see it. And you certainly will not enter it. 
So the final question that needs to be asked is this, how can you be born again? Jesus clearly says here that this is something the Spirit of God does. It's not something you can do. If you were to be born a second time, the Spirit of God must bring it about. Now, again, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. I understand that. But there may be some of you here who are having a difficult time understanding exactly what Jesus means. And if you are, then you're in good company because Nicodemus obviously didn't understand him either. And Jesus must have seen it on his face because he says in verses 7 and 8, Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Now, why would Jesus say that unless Nicodemus was, you know, what do you mean, Jesus, you know? He says, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, Nicodemus was amazed. He didn't understand it. What is it that Nicodemus was really wrestling with here? Actually, two things. First of all, with what Jesus said about the flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Remember, Nicodemus believed that being a Jew was enough to enter into God's kingdom. That which is born of Abraham inherits the kingdom. But Jesus is saying that isn't enough. Well, that was enough to amaze Nicodemus to begin with. But he was also struggling with the second thing, Jesus said, the second birth. If that birth comes from the Spirit of God, if you have no more power over it than you have over the wind, if you can see the effects of this change in your life, but you have no control over where and when the Spirit gives it, then how can you hope to receive it and enter into God's kingdom? Now, one thing we need to recognize is this. What Jesus is saying here can be very daunting. You know, it, it has that, that opposite side, which Jesus doesn't actually address here because the Spirit of God doesn't breathe life into everyone. But we need to see the good news that's here. The Spirit of God does breathe life into some. This is basically the gospel that Jesus is, is telling Nicodemus. This is what it's all about. You don't have to understand how it works. You don't have to be concerned over the fact that you have no control over it. The Spirit will work when and where He wills regardless. Now consider Nicodemus. Nicodemus was amazed. He didn't understand it. And yet... He received it, didn't he? I mean, later we're going to see Nicodemus in a couple of other circumstances. In one case, defending Jesus in front of his peers. That's not a very safe thing to do, or at least it wasn't in those days. When the chief priests and the Pharisees are later going to send officers to the feast to arrest Jesus, they return empty-handed. And, of course, the Pharisees are going to be upset with the officers. Why didn't you arrest him? And Nicodemus is going to stand up for Jesus in John chapter 7, verses 50 through 52. Nicodemus, he who came to him before, being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears him and knows what he is doing, does it? They answered him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Nicodemus was sticking out his neck. For Jesus defending him because he was one of them and then when it comes time after the crucifixion Joseph of Arimathea uh, goes and gathers up courage and asks for the body of Jesus well Nicodemus is the one who helps to bury him John 19 verses 38 through 42 after these things Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus but a secret one for fear of the Jews asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid, Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. You see, you don't have to understand how it works or to have any control over where and when uh, the Spirit 
you know, breathes, as it were, this breath of life in order to receive it. The Spirit will do His work. Now let me just say, if, if you, this morning, love the Father, and if you love Jesus Christ, if they are the center of your life, and you love them more than anything else, if you can say that everything else is a distant second, well then, you basically have this new birth. If you have turned from your sins, and I mean all of your sins, and placed your whole hope of heaven upon Jesus Christ, the only way you can do that is because the Spirit of God has done this work in you. You don't actually need to know, understand again how it works because He has already granted it to you in His mercy. And if that's the case, realize that you have received a gift that is more precious than anything else in the entire world or in the entire universe. Remember how Jesus said on one occasion, you know, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? And what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You see, even if you did own the entire world, you couldn't give it to God in order to give him your Holy Spirit. It's something that he gives sovereignly and it is something worth more than the entire world. And if you have it, you have a great treasure. And so you need to be thankful. You need to set your heart to love God as the Spirit within you moves you to do. And you need to purpose to worship God with your whole life because of this great blessing He has given to you. Now secondly, let me suggest that you know, as we apply this to evangelism, you don't have to understand how this works when you go out to evangelize, all you have to do is believe what God says about the Spirit of God and His work, that He will do it as you are faithful to cast seed and sow seed. And that can give you confidence that when you go out, there are going to be people who believe in Jesus. You know, we, we read the Scriptures and we see what the character of man is like and we realize what Jesus said. If you follow me, you're going to be hated the way that the world hated me. And as we think about evangelizing, we think, you know what, if I share the gospel with this person, they're not going to like me. If I share it with my friend, they're going to cut me off. Well, that might happen. You know, and that fear sometimes stops us from reaching out to others. But do you realize that if you reach out to your friend or that neighbor, that person you're afraid of that's going to turn on you, they may not turn on you. The Spirit of God may actually breathe life into their soul, and if He does, that person who is your friend, that person who is your neighbor, or somebody just walking down the street, they might be saved from hell, and they might actually enter into heaven forever because you were willing to do that. So yes, it's possible it could go the one way, but it's also possible it can go the other way because of what Jesus says here. The Spirit of God works through you and me as we share the gospel with others and he breathes this new life into them and it quickens them to life. There will be success. There will be people who actually do believe and do receive, not because of you necessarily, but because of the Spirit's work. But now lastly, let me just simply apply this to those of you who haven't trusted Jesus. Now since the Spirit of God alone can change your heart, which is what Jesus is saying here. And since the Father and the Son alone have the ability to give the Spirit of God to you, they alone can, can you know, send the Spirit to breathe that new life. If you would have any hope of receiving that life of Jesus Christ instead of the justice that He owes you for the sins that you have committed against Him, well then you need to go to them. You need to go to the Father and the Son in prayer and ask Him for this mercy. Ask the Father, that's what Jesus says, in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, to give you this new birth, to give you the ability to repent, to give you the ability to believe, to give you the desire, because the only thing that stops anyone is that they don't have it in their hearts to trust Jesus. Well, the Spirit of God is the only one who can give that to you, and the Father and the Son alone are able to give the Spirit. You need to go to them, and you need to ask, and you need to keep asking until He actually 
gives you the Spirit because that is your only hope. And let me just encourage you that you're not going to a God who is, is so indisposed towards you necessarily that he's, that he's just going to you know, burn you as it were on the spot. We're talking about going to a God who is gracious, one who is merciful, one who every day shows kindness to his enemies, the one who sent his son into the world to save sinners, the one whose son says, anyone who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. But of course, you have to come sincerely. And in order to do that, you need a spirit. But let me just encourage you, he is gracious. He is merciful. So come to him. Ask him for his mercy. And see if the Lord will not grant you that mercy. Well, may the Lord give you his grace in order that you might do that if you do not know him. And may he give all of us who do know him, may he open our eyes to see what a great treasure he has given to us and also encourage us in our evangelism that he will work through us if we're willing to share the gospel with others. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would apply all these things that we've heard uh, to our particular situation this morning.